Jesse Powell, who is the CEO and co-founder of Kraken. Thank you so much for chatting with me. Absolutely. You started Kraken in 2011 when hardly anyone had ever heard of cryptocurrency and you had the foresight to say, well, we need to set up an exchange. So what led you to get excited about this tech and want to go into an industry focused on blockchain tech and Bitcoin in particular? Yeah, well, before this, I had a company selling virtual items and currencies for online games. So it was already sort of in the digital goods space. And um, when I read about Bitcoin in early 2011, just thought, well, maybe this is another digital currency which we can sell on our e-commerce platform for, for virtual goods. Um, so that was kind of like the first thing that, that drew me to it. Um, but then as I got deeper into it, you know, I read the white paper, I started catching up on all the forums, was reading uh, everything that was out there. And back then you could read everything that was out there. You know, today would be totally impossible. But um, you know, I just became completely immersed in it and started to realize like the the social implications for Bitcoin. You know, what would happen if the world got onto a Bitcoin standard, and um, you know, all of the social problems that could potentially be solved, um, the the changes that would have to happen in government to you know balance a budget. Uh, so just, you know, philosophically, it became very interesting, and um, so I thought like, okay, I want to do something in this space to try to help the adoption of Bitcoin. And um, after the incident with Mt. Gox in June of 2011, you know, it became clear that there needed to be more exchanges. And that was like an obvious thing that, that could be done. And, and I think exchanges are really critical to the ecosystem. And so I saw that as um, you know, something that I could really contribute to. And I, and I had a great co-founder who was sort of the perfect fit to start an exchange with, like the best hacker ever, you know, super top security guy. and. Um, always had had been dabbling in writing bots for financial markets and stuff like that so um just a really strong fit you know to start an exchange so um we got started on it i feel that the more people who come into the space later and later the more removed they are from why bitcoin was created whereas kraken really does seem to be a company that is focused on promoting the ideals that bitcoin enthusiasts at the start were interested in privacy financial autonomy all of that yeah absolutely and you know, we still see the mission as getting crypto into as many hands as possible to grow the adoption of crypto around the world to make it easy for people to get in and out of crypto and to really be that that bridge from the old world to the new world and to be that bridge we can't just operate you know in on the dark web uh you know and serve a tiny niche um you actively have to engage with regulators and banks and educate them and get them comfortable um, because you're really you know it is building a bridge you've got to get people from one side to the other, you know, and, and you've got to, to do that, you need to, to connect at both ends. Mm -hmm. We've invested tremendously in educating regulators, law enforcement, um, all over the world. Uh, and, you know, it's all for the end goal, you know, hopefully one day we can just burn the bridge and when, <laughs> when everyone is on the other side, right? Uh, everyone's on crypto now, cool, uh, adios, you know. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's maybe decades away and there has to be someone you know to, to shepherd everyone across and that's kind of like what we see our mission is absolutely i actually did an interview with ron paul the other day he said the same thing that the most important thing we can be doing right now is educating regulators about this teaching people and kraken has had some issues with regulators in the past like in i think it was 2014 the bit license came in you guys had to close up shop in new york and almost everyone in crypto in fact everyone in crypto had to close up shop and they just you know, trickled out the bit license uh, kind of to whoever was friends with Ben Lorsky at the time. And it's totally scammy what he did. You know, he he got this bit license introduced, which, um, you know, they would say it's for the protection of the consumer of New York. And I think most people of New York would say that they feel more like hostages than than people who are being protected. And, you know, he left office and immediately started a consulting firm to help people get their bit license. And um, they've given out very few. Most companies have left the state because the requirements are so onerous and they want to have so much control over not just what happens in New York, but your entire global business. It's not really tenable, you know, and, and when you look at New York in the context of like a, a global business, it's it's one small place, you know, and even the entirety of the United States is only 20 percent of our business. So, you know, to to invest that kind of resources into a single state. Um, you know, it just didn't make sense for us. What kind of obstacles have you seen when coming up against regulators? Is it lack of understanding? Have there been other issues you've had to deal with? Yeah, lack of understanding is a huge one. Um, some regulators are better than others. Uh, some regulators 
have short terms in, because of corruption issues. Uh, so they may be cycling out frequently. So you might end up educating people over and over again because you know it's such a, a difficult thing to get your head around. And, and it's only one of the many things that they may be working on. So you know you might spend like two years bringing them up to speed and they're like, great, got it. Um, but now I'm, I'm out of here. You're going to have to like, you know, start all over with the next guy who takes my place. So that's really difficult in the United States, you know, where we're dealing with the lawmakers and then the regulators and, and the regulators are just enforcing what the lawmakers told them to do. Basically, you know, if you go to the SEC, they can't change the law for you. They can just say, look, like this is what it is. Our job is to enforce it on people. If you want to change what the law is, you have to go to Congress. So we're spending time with people in Congress to try to get it changed because you can't blame the SEC for doing what they're doing. You know, it's like blaming a shark for biting you. It's like, well, you were there, you know, you know, the shark eats people. So we want the enforcement agencies to, to focus on the real bad actors. And there's lots of low hanging fruit there. Um, and you know, the guys that are trying to do it right, um, you know, to take a little bit easy, um, you don't necessarily have to, you know, take an aggressive stance um, on enforcement. And for the the legislators, the guys writing the laws, just to to get them to understand that, you know, this is like a new world that's developing, and the old rules leave a lot of room for interpretation, or there's a lot of gray area, um, or things that just don't apply that are just bad. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where they assume that, you know, for a transaction, there's always going to be a middleman, and because of that assumption, there's something in place that, you know mandates there be a middleman or mandate some insurance policy be a part of the transaction or something like that you know which it just doesn't apply in this world new laws need to be written that address that because until then um, you have many traditional financial services companies who will just say like we're just out you know we can't get in until we have absolute clarity because you know our business is so big globally we just can't risk whatever you know taking a risk on interpreting something or even just breaking the law even though it's ridiculous they just you know don't want to touch it i see a lot of companies petitioning government to say yes there should be middlemen also we should be the middlemen you know this regulatory capture where people force these bad policies on in an industry that doesn't need them so that they can hold the keys right i mean i guess you see this in every industry there are businesses in our space which are attempting to have legislation created which would require companies to use their business, you know, basically like blockchain analytics firms, um, market analysis firms, insurance providers, you know, things like that, where, you know, unfortunately there's this conflict of interest, right? They're incentivized to pay lobbyists and to, to try to have the law affected, you know, to, to benefit them. And really it's going to be at the cost to, to all the consumers and, and everyone else. Yeah. You see that sort of rent seeking happening across the board. So it's no surprise that it's happening in blockchain. Talking about regulatory pressure, different exchanges have had issues with privacy coins that pressured into delisting them. Do you think that exchanges can find a happy medium where privacy coins can have a place on them? For sure. And, and the laws on privacy coins differ all over the world. Financial privacy is like a fundamental right and it's important. Um, you know, you don't want uh, you know, your employer knowing everything that you're doing, you know, with your money. Let's say they paid you in Bitcoin. And they can watch your address and they see where you're sending your Bitcoin to, right? And you don't necessarily want that or you don't want your you know, insurance provider having that information. There are all sorts of legitimate reasons to have financial privacy. And, um, you know, we're big supporters of the privacy coins for that reason. Anything can be used for uh, nefarious purposes. Uh, you know, I think it's just going to take government some time to, to understand really where the benefit is of privacy coins and how they're important. And, um, you know, you don't have to use them for everything, but um, I think they, they serve a purpose for sure. And um, I think they'll, they'll become more widely accepted over time. You know, some things that we've, we've heard regulators say is who are actually pro-privacy coins that, well, Bitcoin is already, it's so liquid and so large that if you wanted to, like, conceal your Bitcoin transaction, just kind of mix it, you know, so that the trail was lost you could do that. It's not like that difficult to do. You're not going to like ban Bitcoin, right? So so then it's kind of like, well, why are we banning these other privacy coins? I'm looking forward to the future. I'm wondering about where DEXs will come into play now that regulation is getting harder to navigate, especially in jurisdictions where crypto isn't allowed at all. Do you think that DEXs are going to have a more prominent role? Are they going to be become essential uh, to a free society? I think so. Yeah, I, I think 
it's great to have them there as a hedge. You know, we have to assume that the worst will happen and maybe all the exchanges will be outlawed at some point. And it'll be nice to have the DEXs there. And we've already seen at least one case of um, a regulator going after a DEX creator. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we will see more of that. The best DEX will be one with the sort of Satoshi story, which is anonymously just put out there. No one knows who did it. No one can go to the founder and throw him in jail. No one can tell him to like change the protocol. That's what it's going to take to be a really successful DEX to, to basically not be able to be compromised. Mm -hmm. But most of them now are fully out in the open. You know, we know who the development teams are. We know where they are. I think there's still many years away from being really useful to, to retail, you know, to, to the average consumer because they're relatively complicated to use, relatively illiquid. Um, there's not like a massive support team behind them to help people, you know, get through the process. But I think we will eventually get there or, or, or there'll be some sort of aggregation service of DEXs. It could even be Kraken. It could be other kind of centralized exchanges, which eventually expose the DEX to... Um, yeah, and, and maybe actually maybe provide support services, you know, customer service uh, help as well. So I think there's some way that, that the DEXs end up, you know, as part of the ecosystem. I mean, even now they're they're useful if you want to do small trades. You know, you're just interested in non-custodial atomic swaps of one thing for another. Um, they're great for that. I think there's a misconception about the counterparty risk of a DEX. And we've already seen tons of bugs appear in smart contracts. And DEXs are fairly complicated, smart contracts. Just because something is open source doesn't mean it's necessarily secure. You know, and most of these don't have like a lot of great security minds auditing them very thoroughly, right? And, and the bounty is pretty high to find a problem with it. So they have like a lot of bad guys kind of looking to exploit bugs in smart contracts. And so there's that still exists as a possibility, right? It's not completely riskless. Like you could still somehow lose money there. But I think the confidence will be built up over time as you have like a track record, you know, just as with Bitcoin, you know, you have time that goes on where bugs aren't found and people get more confident. Well, thank you so much for your time. This has been great. And thank you for everything that Kraken has done for the space. Thank you. Appreciate it.